Hi. Today we're going to look at the 2007 AP Statistics exam. This is problem four from the free response section. It describes investigators at the Department of Agriculture who wish to compare methods of determining E. coli levels in contamination in beef. So there's two different methods available for testing the beef for contamination, methods that are called A and B in this case. And both methods were applied to each of 10 randomly selected specimens of a certain type of beef. And here we are, we've got data points down below. I think it's important to always start these problems by looking at the data you're given and just making sure you understand what the data is measuring. So if we look right here at this set of data I circled, this is beef specimen number one. And what they're telling us is, is that method A determined that there were 22.7 millimicrobes per liter of E. coli on this particular piece, piece of beef. And method B determined there were 23 millimicrobes per liter on the same specimen of beef. A problem like this is sort of natural to do a match pairs design because if you have one particular piece of, like a steak in front of you or something and you want to test and see how much E. coli it has, it makes sense to try and use both methods on the same piece of beef because we know that the amount of the coli in that piece of beef won't change, but the responses we can get from the two different methods might be different. And what you can see is there's been an effort here. If we look at the rest of the data, we circle, say, another data point over here, specimen number four, we can see, again, both testing methods A and B have been applied. Only in this case, it looks like method A, if we look carefully up here, method A had a higher amount than method B did, and, uh, and so forth. So there's a bunch of data here for us to look at. OK, so in reality, what we're really interested in is we'd like to make a new list of the differences. And you need to pick an order in which you're going to subtract things. So maybe we'll do method A minus method B. The order really doesn't matter. We know we have 10 specimens, so I'll make a little chart here. And what we want to do is subtract these things. So for example, in the first case, if we were to subtract the 22.7 and the 23, we would get negative 0.3. And then what we can do is continue in that fashion. If we subtract the next pair, we would have, let's use a different color, we'd have 23.6 minus 23.1. That would give us positive 0.5. While you're at it, look at that 0.5. That 0.5 is saying that method A detected 5, 0.5 millimicrobes per liter extra of contamination in that second specimen of beef. And we can continue down the list here and find differences for all of these. So it turns out this could be the first thing you want to do in this problem is find a list of all your differences. So I'm not going to write them all out here. This one will end up being, say, 0.3. This will be 0.6. I guess maybe I could write them all out. This looks like it's 0 0.8, 0 0.7. And let's try a few others. Let's see what else we've got. Let's see, after 1.7, I've got a 1.2 as a difference, then a 0.2, then a negative 0.1. That's kind of interesting. That's sort of the reverse order. You can see that method B determined that there were more um, millimicrobes per liter of E. coli than method A did. And then lastly, down here, we have um, a, a full difference of negative 1. So that's the most dramatic difference um, other than the 1.2, but in, it's in the other direction. Look at the 1.2, we can see that method A detected more in that case. All right, so I'm noticing that most of these differences are positive. So that might lead me to believe that method A since we're doing A minus B, that might lead me to believe that method A detects more than method B for the same type of beef. OK, let's read the question and see what they want us to do here. They're saying, is there a significant difference in the mean amount of E. coli bacteria detected by the two methods? OK, so they're interested in the mean difference. So we might as well, while we're at it, compute the mean difference for our sample. I'm going to call that X bar sub D. And to do this, I would recommend taking this list of data, put it in a TI-84 calculator, then go to Stat, Calc, One Variable Statistics, and just make sure you select the name of the proper list where you put your data. And in this case, I'm getting a difference of 0.29. 
Also, I should make note of the standard deviation of the difference. Now, let's just be careful of the little x. Just make sure that you're clear that that's an x. The standard deviation of x sub d. So the standard deviation of the differences. And I'm seeing about, you know, if we round, probably about 0.63. Okay. So you should identify what type of test you're going to use here today. This is an example of a one sample matched pairs t-test. So people ask me sometimes, they say, well, how do you, how do you spot the difference, say, between a t-test and a z-test? So this problem is a t-test because we do not have a population standard deviation. So just standard deviation population is unknown. So that means that we're using a t-test. OK, let's, uh, let's be more formal and, and get to it. So we've said all these things. Let's, let's start off by saying let mu sub d equal um, the mean difference in E. coli detected by the two methods. Okay, and in our case, we're deciding we're going to do method A minus method B. Always indicate what order you want to subtract in. Okay, so HO, our null hypothesis. A null hypothesis always indicates that there's really no difference between the two things. So in our case, we're going to say mu sub D is zero. That there is no difference in the amount of E. coli that either one of these methods detects. And HA is going to be something else about mu sub D. It's either greater than, less than, or not equal to. Those are usually your options. So if we read the question here, I'll highlight it for you. Let's pick my highlighter. Let's go with purple. It says, is there a significant difference in the mean amount of E. coli? So you'll notice this problem is not specifying, is method A detect more, does method B detect more? Just is there a significant difference? So that means that mu D here is not equal to zero. So that's what we have. OK, so now it's on for assumptions. Number one, we're supposed to have an SRS, but it did mention that in the problem. There's 10 randomly selected pieces of beef. Let's make a note of the sample size while we're here. Number two, we want to make sure that our population of all beef is greater than 10 times the sample size, which in this case is 10 times 10 or 100. So I think it's safe to assume that. And then because this formula is true, we can find the standard deviation of our sampling distribution, x bar. And that's always going to be the standard deviation of x sub d over the square root of our sample size. So we did find that in the previous page. Let's go back here. There it is right there, 0.63. And while we're at it, we're going to keep track of that. x bar sub d is 0.29. So this is 0.63 on top over the square root of 10. Let me divide that for you and see what we get. So points, oop, hold on a second, 0.63 divided by the square root of 10. And we get, I'm getting 0.199. I'm <clears throat> just going to make a note here, x bar sub d was 0.29, just so I don't lose track of that. All right, and then last, you're supposed to check that it's safe to use the t-test. All right, sometimes this is called the normality check. And even though it's not exactly normal, we're looking for symmetry with no outliers in our box plot. So you want to make a box plot for this. So let's, let's do that. Um, if you have a T84, it's easy to do. You do second Y equals. You select a box plot. Make sure you pick the right list. And then press zoom 9, and you should get a pretty picture of it. In this case, here's the graph I'm getting. It's got a slightly longer tail on the left-hand side. So this is the graph. It just looks something like that. So what are we going to note here? That there's no outliers. Oop, sorry, I wrote not. Forgive me. So we're going to make a note that there's no outliers. And only moderate, I'm going to call this moderate skewness. Some people might even call that weak skewness. <clears throat> so because of these two things, it's safe. Um, to use the t-test. Sorry about that.
So there you have it. So now we're ready to start working on our test. So here we go. We draw our distribution, which looks like a normal distribution, but we know it's really a t distribution. <clears throat> uh, let's make a note. N was 10 here. So in a t distribution, you care about degrees of freedom. So 10 minus 1 or 9. It's always n minus 1 to get your degrees of freedom. So there you have it. Okay. Um, so here we are. We got mu sub d equals 0 in the middle. Our standard deviation of x bar sub d was 0.199. That's from the previous page. So I like to mark that off. Here's the 0.199. Um, if I do 0.199 times 2 to get the other number, we end up getting over here 0.398. And then I go down here, negative 0.199, negative 0.398. And there you are. And finally, we're going to mark off x bar sub d. So x bar sub d is 0.29 in this case. So that's somewhere over in here. And here's where we got to be careful. So since our HA in this case was that mu sub d does not equal 0, then what you want to do is go to equal distance down to the left that you went to the right. So you go over here to negative 0.29. And we see it on the outside, <clears throat> both of these boundaries. All right, so we're getting closer and closer. We just want to get a, a T score, and then we're on our way. So we're going to say t equals x bar sub d minus 0 over s of x bar sub d. In our case, it's going to be 0.29 minus 0 or 0.199. So let me get that number for you. I am getting t is 1.46 about. So we're not a lot of standard deviations away. Don't forget what a t-score is. It's telling you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. What I'd like to do is turn this t-score into a area or a p-value. So to do that, you use something called t-cdf. Your lower bound is going to be 1.46. Your upper bound is going to be some kind of huge number. And the degrees of freedom are going to be 9. So to find that, you do second vars. There's a button to VRS, distributions. Go down to number 6, the TCDF button. I'm going to say 1.46, a huge number, and degrees of freedom 9, paste. And I'm getting an area here just of this one tail. This one tail here is 0 0.089. Well, that means that this area is also 0 0.089. And so the p-value, the real p-value for this, you're going to have multiply 0.089 times 2. We end up getting this. So our p-value is 0.178, which, by the way, is way bigger than alpha equals 0.05 or any other kind of uh, alpha level. Sometimes we use alpha equals 0.01, certainly bigger than that. And so what do we say here then? Uh, because this p-value is so big, we're going to say we fail to reject HO. So that's a super important fact, and we're failing to reject HO. <clears throat> so that means that we did not find evidence to suggest that these methods differ in the amount of E. coli that they detected. So let me just say that again. We did not find evidence to suggest that the mean amount of E. coli detected by the two methods was different. OK, uh, while I'm at it, the question doesn't ask this, but I want to relate this to a confidence interval. Because it turns out there's a special relationship between confidence intervals and whether or not you accept or reject HO in a test. So every concept interval would have its assumptions, which we've already done here. We've worked on all those assumptions on this page over here before. So you would need to check all these things to make sure it's safe to use your confidence interval. So we are doing a one sample t interval, what this is called. And it's a t interval for the same reason it was a t test. We do not have the standard deviation of the population. x bar plus or minus t star. Um, s of x sub d of the square root of n. It's a basic format. 
So in our case, we have 0.29 plus or minus. Now, T star we're going to leave out for a minute. This was, uh, if I remember from earlier, uh, here we are. It was this, this number right here, just in case you lost track of it, the 0.63. So this is 0.63 over the square root of 10. Now, <clears throat> we're going to need to decide a confidence level. Since alpha equals 0.05 almost all the time when we do significance tests, that means we want to compute a 95% confidence interval. So we want to find the T star that goes to 95% confidence. So to do that, we draw a T distribution. Remember the degrees of freedom are equal to um, 9. And what we're going to do next is we're going to shade in the middle 95% of area, 0.95. And that's what we've done. And we have to ask ourselves how much area is in this tail. Well, that's not so bad to do. We know the whole area into the curve is 1. So we subtract off the 0.95 and divide by 2. And if you do that correctly, you're going to get 0.025. So it turns out there's a button in your calculator that will help you get the T star that goes with this. So to do that, we want to use something called inverse T. Inverse T, 0 0.025, comma, the degrees of freedom that you want, which in this case are 9. So that's also in the distributions menu. It's going to ask you for the area and degrees of freedom. You'll just enter those things, and you'll get a T score. It takes a little bit of time. In this case, I'm getting negative 2.262. So in our constant interval, I'm going to put positive 2.262, and we're ready to compute our confidence interval. Now, I want you to keep in mind that when we did our significance test, we failed to reject HO. HO was that the difference between these two tests was zero. And when we did our math, it turned out that um, we failed to predict our HOR p-value was too big, and so we couldn't conclude that the, that the difference was something other than zero. So when I do my confidence interval, watch what happens over here. I get a confidence interval that goes from negative 0.16, and this is, I want to emphasize the word negative here, to positive 0.74. So what does that mean? Well, notice um, zero is in the interval. But it turns out that's incredibly important. Since HO is in the interval, we can't reject HO. So anytime the significance test fails to reject HO, then you should expect your confidence interval to capture HO. And that's an important relationship to know that exists between the idea of a significance test and a confidence interval. Okay, great. Thanks for watching.